All righty, good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Thanks, Sherry. Uh, are there um, are there any questions before we get started on the lecture? Okay, then. Um, so today, uh, my plan is um, uh, it's a little bit of a uh, mixed bag. We're gonna do we're gonna do a, a few different things. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, replicating portfolios. We talked about um, we talked about how to compute expectations. Um, but remember the mantra that says that pricing is uh, replication. Sometimes we forget. Uh, it, sometimes it can be easy to forget that uh, this expectation that we are we are computing the price of the derivative. Uh, we should actually be computing both that expectation as well as the replicating portfolio. So how does one compute the replicating portfolio? I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, then we move on to, uh, well, it's in the same it's in the same spirit, but we move on to these two stochastic volatility models that are in the homework, uh, Histons and uh, Stein and Stein's uh, stochastic wall model. So these are uh, these are uh, in the homework, and this is where we will be using uh, characteristic functions. Which we've been talking about uh, yeah, quite some uh, in quite some lectures. Um, I think we've had maybe three or four lectures on it, and we've also had uh, a homework. Uh, more questions about characteristic functions. So now we're gonna, gonna try to use them for uh, stochastic volatility models. And in particular, you're gonna be implementing them, uh, I think in homework number four. So these two things are related and then we're gonna shift gears. So we talked about uh, simulating um, uh, these uh, SDEs. Uh, there's, a, there's an important process that's called the Cox process. Which we haven't talked about. So this is a very this is like a this is a jump process used um, used to model uh, credit events uh, such as um, uh, such as default, and it leads to these um, it leads to um, used for example to, to price what's called these uh, CDS contracts. CDS contracts, this is uh, credit default swaps. So I want to show you uh, what a Cox process is and I want to show you how, um, how one can simulate it and how one can use it to price a credit default swap. Um, we have talked about swaps. There have been swaps in one of the earlier homeworks where you were asked to uh, convert um, like observed swap rates into zero coupon bonds and compute C spreads and so on. And credit default is not very far away from those swap rates. So this is not a big leap. It, um, and we, and we, it's, these cost processes, they, they're used for many other things, but they're used to, uh, for example, mosquito in here they used to for example model these uh, credit events um, and credit events this could be default it could be many other things and just default there uh, 
there are, there are many other events than default that would trigger a payment in a CDS contract. But um, right, so that's I wanted to show you how to use simulation to uh, to get these uh, Cox processes out. And then uh, either today or next time the the big topic is going to be copulas. And um, and I posted I posted notes uh, on uh, Canvas. There are also inside these notes. There are notes about um, last time we talked about the um, the Browning Bridge. Uh, these notes here. They also have information about Cox processes. They also have notes about uh, like the Browning Bridge from last time. Okay, so I, I don't think we're gonna get. We're probably gonna get down to these Cox processes, and then next time we'll we'll start with these uh, copulas. Are there are there any questions or comments before we get started? Okay, then um, when you talk about replication, like so to price to price a um, <coughs> a payoff. So this is a derivative. To price a payoff or a derivative, um, let's call it um, uh, f of s t, where um, f is our function, and uh, s t is this our uh, this is the stock price. Uh, we need to compute, we need to find or construct uh, xt. So xt here is, is uh, we need to construct the wealth process. The wealth process. This guy xt such that such that what? Such that at the end, xt is exactly f of f of st. So that's the deal. And um, uh, quite often we're focused on just creating the x zero, which is then the initial value of the wealth. Uh, that will give me the terminal value uh, f of st, but it, we should really construct all of it. In particular, we should construct how we should trade in the stock to replicate this f of st. So let me let me just recall how how this goes about. Um, so let's um, so we have uh, we have two accounts. We have two uh, traded securities. Uh, have the bank. So this is our ST0. We're going to write the dynamics of the bank as ST0 RT DT. And we're going to have the stock. We write the stock as TST. Uh, this is equal to ST. And then we have RT DT plus. Sigma T, DBT, uh, Q. Okay, so you should have seen uh, somewhere that, uh, so, so here Q, Q is the, um, so Q is a um, restitutional measure. Q is a uh, risk neutral measure. Uh, risk neutral measure means that if I look at um, if I look at ST tilde, which is the stock divided by the bank, this thing uh, has no uh, DT term. And this is why 
<clears throat> this is why R has to be in both places here. So Q is a risk neutral measure if this process here has no DT term. And you can see that one way to see it is to apply the ETO. You can either, uh, you can apply, uh, you can apply uh, ETO to compute DST tilde, or you can solve these two equations over here, or you can solve, so if you solve the first one, this, this is an exponential. So you get that ST zero, the bank account price, this is equal to the initial one. And it is an exponential of an integral from zero to T of R U D U. And likewise down here, this one here you can solve, it's again gonna be an exponential, but keep in mind you have credit variation over here. So you can solve for is T, it's gonna be the initial value and it's gonna be an exponential. And then the drift part, this will be the same, R U. And then you're gonna get a correction term because of Ito's lemma and it's one half credit variation of the rounding motion term. So that's sigma squared. Du plus an integral with respect to Brownian motion, sigma u, dBu. And though, then you see that when you take the ratio, then these two things combined, it's gonna imply that st tilde, st tilde will be what? It'll be s zero divided by the initial value of the bank, and it'll be an exponential. And the exponential will be minus one half an integral from zero to t of sigma u du plus that stochastic integral with respect to Brownian motion. And then when you apply it to lemma here, you're going to get that there is no dt term. And when you look at dst tilde, this is going to be exactly st tilde. And this is all q's. This is sigma t dBT q. And that's again, because you have correct variation here, that one half sigma squared is gonna pop out of each of lemma and you need this term here to cancel out all of the dt terms. Right, so <clears throat> q is a risk neutral measure and, and one thing, uh, one thing that you should have hopefully studied is um, how many risk neutral measures are there? Is it unique and so on? Um, so I dropped my mosquito this time. One less mosquito in the house. Okay. And um, uh, there's a connection between, between uniqueness, right? So, so the first, the fundamental theorems fundamental theorems uh, of, um, of asset pricing I do have the first one it says that um, uh, if there is such a measure Q if there is a measure if there is a risk neutral measure uh, Q till Q. Well, then, then there is no R. So that was the first one. And the second one says that if Q is unique, if Q is unique, uh, then uh, all claims, or all uh, payoffs, I should say. Then all payoffs, I should be more specific here, this should be bounded. Then all payoffs bounded uh, can be replicated.
Right, so it's the second one that, that we're going to be. Um, so it's these two theorems that we, we have a Q because we have exactly those dynamics here. We started out with this measure that had that had the property that started out with a measure Q such that DST has this form. Okay, that is a risk neutral measure because when I divide ST by ST naught, I'm going to get a uh, I'm going to get a process that has no DT terms. Um, so I have one now uniqueness. This has to do with uh, could there be more than just this one measure in there? And this is where you look at the filtration. Um, so uniqueness here, this part you should check. You should check the um, check the filtration uh, to see uh, how many how many Brownian motions there are. So let me give you some examples on how, how one can do this. Um, the first one, the first one is Black Shoals. So Black Shoals says you take the filtration. This is going to be the one that's coming from that one brown in motion we had. So you look in the filtration, how many brown in motions are there? There is one okay so just make a mental note of there is one brown motion here and then you look at you look at how do you specify uh, r and sigma in black shoals well the way you specify there is you take r t r t this is a constant this is a constant r and sigma t is a constant Sigma. Okay, so that's Black Scholes. And then the second fundamental theorem of Vasopising says that um, provided provided that sigma is not zero, then provided that sigma is not zero, then uh, because there's only one bound motion, have your one stock. Provided that sigma is not zero, then um, is one stock and one uh, brown in motion. There's one stock and there's one brown in motion. Uh, and that brown in motion doesn't have a vanishing volatility. This gives you completeness. This implies uh, completeness. Which means that you can replicate. So the, the theorem then says that you give me so any claim, so any payoff, any payoff, uh, what did we call it? Was it G component? It? it was F, F of ST can be replicated. It doesn't say how, it just says that you can. Uh, so any payoff can be replicated, but how? The second fundamental theorem of asset pricing doesn't say anything about that. And this is what, what we're interested in today. Let me just give you another example before we fill in the details here. And another example would be if we look at um, uh, the infamous uh, Heston model. So Heston's model says, um, uh, this is Heston. So now if T is going to change, there'll be two brown emotions in here. There'll be one that has a B like before, and then there'll be another one that has this one. Right, so I have two independent brown emotions. These two guys here. These two guys here independent. Brown in motions, right? So if I look at the cross variation between the two, I'm gonna get zero. So 
Now we make a mental note, we have two brown emotions and we only have one stock. So this is where trouble can happen. Um, so, so the second fundamental theorem of acid pricing is gonna tell us that there's trouble in paradise here. So we have one stock, we have one stock and two brown emotions. This is gonna imply uh, incompleteness. So they exist. So there, there are, uh, there are the payoffs, f of st, which cannot uh, be replicated. If you were to specify fully what um, what Heston's model is, Heston would take um, Heston would take uh, RT is a constant, and um, and sigma would be a square root of VT, and DVT would be this filler process kappa theta minus vt dt and then beta root vt uh, inside here you would have uh, rho dbt q plus root one minus rho squared dw that's that's fellow's model and because you have both B and W here, if you both have B and W here, then uh, the model is gonna be uh, incomplete. So a special case, one could look at a special case. So a special case, a special case would be when you take rho to be equal to say one. If I pick row to be equal to one, a special case sets uh, the filtration just to be the one generated by B. Sets this thing equal to, we throw away the W one, right? And then likewise, we put row equal to one. And then you're gonna get that DVT, the volatility, this is kappa theta minus VT dt plus beta root vt dbtq. And then you get completeness. And this special case is complete. Um, this is complete provided, um, provided again that the volatility uh, provided again that the volatility is sigma t, which was equal to root bt. Uh, this is strictly positive. So this is Fellow's condition that we also talked about before. Fellow's condition is the one that says that the um, the volatility has to be has to be big. So let's see if I can remember it. It's one half, and then beta squared, which has to be bigger than uh, kappa theta. So in this special case, you will have, if we, if we summarize, if you write out what the bang is, so the bang is, is a constant interest rate and the stock, this is, uh, the stock has drift R and it has volatility, the square root of um, the fellow process which is and then into with respect to the Brownian motion, right? And there's only one Brownian motion floating around here. So this B here, this is exactly the same B as the one that drives the volatility. So in Heston's model, you can have both a complete model and you can have an incomplete case. 
And it depends on uh, this row parameter. If you pick row to be uh, if you pick row to be one, then the W part, this is the one that gives you the incompleteness, it drops out. Um, okay, this is a very, very quick overview of uh, uh, these, these theorems from uh, continuous time and surprising. Are there any questions or comments on, on what we had on these slides here? Now we got we got the um, we got the um, we got all the concepts uh, uh, refreshed and we still stuck. Right? We 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 want to we we still stuck with creating this xt here, and we now have the feeling that we we need a model that doesn't have too many rounding motions compared to the number of stocks we have. Uh, so let's see how to do that. In, um, in the case, uh, say of um, black holes and intestines, right? So let's. So how to create? How do we create xt like that stochastic process such that at the end we're going to get exactly f of st? How do we do that? How do we create this wealth process? I think for, for many equity models, often not always, uh, not always, uh, equity models, equity models uh, use uh, an interest rate that's equal to zero. It's not always the case, but it, it just makes it a little bit easier. So I don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry about uh, discounting. Right? So here we'll get that um, the bank account is, is just always equal to uh, the initial value and let's set that to be one. And the stock, this is ST and now there's no drift, it'll just be Sigma T, DBT. <clears throat> so that that just simplifies a little bit. I don't have to have a DT term here. I don't have to have the same DT term now. So so let me just do that for for simplicity. Okay. So <clears throat> what do I want? Well, in this case, the wealth. So also recall what the wealth is like. This is where you use the self-financing condition. The self-financing condition. So it'll say that DXT DXT is gonna be uh, like the number of shares that you hold in the bank. Then the bank changes plus the number of shares you hold in the stock times the stock uh, dynamics, right? And if I am in this model where R is equal to zero, then this term here, this is my zero. And I end up with just theta T, uh, ST, sigma T, dBTQ. So those are my wealth dynamics. And so what I wanna do is I wanna find, find theta, construct theta, Construct theta such that such that uh, such that what such that when we integrate it, so we want to construct x t and x zero such that when I integrate, I will have an integral here from zero to capital T theta t s t sigma t d b t. But this is my xt, and this is the thing I want to be f of st. But that's the goal: construct, construct this initial value, and construct this theta here, 
such that when I plug them into this formula, I'm going to miraculously end up with the outcome uh, of, so I take the outcome of the stock, plug it into the payoff function, and I want the right-hand side to be equal to the left-hand side. How would we find that theta then? Well, let's go back to the two examples that we had. Um, let's go back to the Black Shoals example. So we do the Black Shoals, that's when sigma is a constant. So sigma c uh, is a constant. If I want this to be true, what I then do is I compute the conditional expectation of both sides. So then we'll use that. If I look at the conditional expectation under Q of F of ST given FT, actually this is why the filtration is quite important here. This is a constant. The filtration is the one that just comes from the one Brownian motion. So we have, this is a constant and it's not zero. The filtration is generated by one Brownian motion. I wanna compute this because I see here that the left-hand side, this has a martingale structure. It's just because dx is equal to something with db and this is a martingale. So I'll get that this one here is then gonna be xt. Okay, but we note that this object here, well, this is gonna be a martingale. This is gonna be a martingale on the cube. Right, this is this Levy martingale that we've had before. When I take a random variable and I condition, I get a martingale. So I have a Levy martingale on the left-hand side. Okay, so that, um, that's, that's good. And then we need, so we have a function of ST, so we need a Markov structure. So we have a Levy martingale, and I want to write this is a Libby, so that's that's one thing. And we also need I have a conditional expectation of a stochastic process at a later time. I need a Markov property. I need a Markov uh, property. So I need to look for a Markov property of S on the Q. So do we have a Markov process? So we need to look at DST under that measure Q. This was ST. Sigma now, uh, dBT, Q. And so to check for the Markov property, what you need to look for is, so is ST, is ST a Markov process? When this thing, has dynamics according to the formula. And the way to do that is you look at the, the drift and the volatility. In this case, there's only volatility. So you look at this thing and you need to check, is this a function? Is this a function of ST alone? And if the answer is yes, yes, then that implies ST is Markov. If the answer is no, well, then ST, you need more. The answer is no. ST is not Markov. And you need more processes. And you need to augment with additional processes. I'll show an example in a second when we're done with this one. So here the answer is yes. This is really true. I'm looking at the volatility. The volatility is ST times sigma. The answer is, is this a function of ST alone? And the answer is yes. So we're good. That means that ST is a Markov process. Again, here I'm not proving anything. I'm just showing you how to work how to work with the uh, stochastic calculus in this specific uh, setting of uh, derivative pricing. And um, if you want to test for Markovian, you look at the dynamics 
you see what the drift and the volatility are functions of. And in this particular case, there's no drift, so we don't have to worry about that. We only have to worry about the volatility. Is it a function of the left-hand side alone? And if the answer is yes, then you're good. That means that this conditional expectation up here, this means that they, there's a function g such that you only need to keep track of the current value as t to create or compute uh, this conditional expectation. Because this is Markov, you give me a function, apply it to it, then the conditional expectation, you only need to keep track of the current value of the stock. Okay, and how do we find how do we find this function? Well, this is where we use the mark, mark uh, the Martingale property. The um, you apply you apply e to to compute d g t s t. And, um, right, so you're going to have uh, g one d t plus uh, g two dst plus one half g22 and then the critical variation of s and let's plug in what we get here remember g1 this is the derivative with respect to the first entry g2 this is the derivative with respect to the second entry and i dropped the t and the st in the um, in the notation on the right hand side just to keep it a little bit more manageable and if you plug in you'll get a g1 here you'll get a g2 and then DST, this was this was the one we had here. This was ST sigma dBT cube. And then we have one half G22, and then the critical variation here. This is going to be ST squared, sigma squared, critical variation of Brownian motion. This is DT. And then we use the Martingale property. So the Martingale property. implies that um, that there uh, is the dynamics of dt should have a zero dt and plus only only the martingale only the stochastic integral with respect to running motion should be a zero dt Okay, so for that to happen, we're going to get a PD, right? So you replace ST by say X. So the PD, you're going to get G1 of T and X. Let me write out the input parameters and then you'll have one half G22 of T and X. And then it'll be X squared sigma. And this got to be zero. And you'll have the terminal condition G at the end is going to be exactly F the payoff. So that'll be your that'll be your PD. So this is another way. Um, this is when you have the Markov uh, when you have the Markov uh, property, you can calculate this conditional expectation here. Uh, using PDEs, and then you match up. Okay, I want I want G to be exactly X. Okay, so how will I do that? Okay, you said, so to get X, to get the uh, theta T, right, that's my stochastic process that I want, as well as the initial value, you set, uh, to get that, what do you do? You set, you said G T of S T to be, uh, xt. Okay, so you match up the initial value. The initial value will be x0. You want that to be g at the initial point. And now, how do you match up? How do you get your theta? You want to get theta and the initial value. This was the initial value. And then you take the dynamics of both sides. You will have the dg. Um, is equal to dx. Okay, so work out what the left hand side is. dg was what we had here. This was g2 of tst 
ST sigma dBTQ. And on the other hand, you have dx. Where did it, dx go? This is where we need to use the self financing condition. The self financing condition. Self financing condition was, this was here. Theta s and then sigma is a constant now. So we have theta t s t sigma dv t q. And we can see now <clears throat> we have only db terms on the left hand side, we have only db terms on the right hand side, and these will cancel out. I'm going to get here that theta t is equal to this g2 t s t. So the derivative. This is the derivative of the uh, call price with respect to uh, the stock. In particular, if you want to know what the initial value is, the initial value, the initial uh, value. So that's the initial replicating portfolio. This is going to be G2 of T uh, 0, S0, right? So remember what that is. This is the derivative with respect to S0 of uh, G, right? So this is the derivative. This here is the call. This is the. Um, this is the this is x zero. So the derivative of the initial wealth with respect to variations in the stock price. I wanted to show you my notes are all messed up now. This here is called the delta. Uh, this here is called the delta. This is the delta. This is the delta of the option. Right, so here's the derivative. So if you look at, <coughs> if you look at the textbook, uh, Steve Shreve's textbook for, um, the, the book that's being used in um, uh, in uh, 622 and also the book we started using in the undergraduate 45. Uh, when you flip over to these, this section that I'm recalling here, uh, it's this section five, you'll be able to find much more uh, information in there. But when you look at, um, like, so for example, here, the, the value of the wealth process under the risk neutral measure. So, if you look at 214, uh, you'll see that you see that his his wealth has dynamics that are given in terms of this delta. He calls the integrand, the portfolio, he calls it for delta, delta t. And the reason he calls it for delta t is because it's ultimately going to be this. Um, in this derivative here, and this is called the delta, the delta process. And there are many, many other derivatives that you could compute. And let me just show you some of them. So again, let's go back to, to Hall's book. Uh, you can find uh, lots of useful information in here as we have already talked about. Um, but if you flip up in the introduction, in the um, table of contests, and you look for Greeks, they are in here somewhere. and. Um, Depending on what version you're looking at, this one here is version number seven. This is what, 10 years old. I don't know how far up he has gotten this year's from. Yeah, you can see the list of years here, right? It's every every couple of years there's a new version. So this is a version from 2009. So it's more than 10 years old. Um, the versions are not that different. He just moves stuff around. But if you look at at in this version, the chapter 17, the Greek letters. And then you can go down, you can see delta hedging, theta, gamma. There are lots of them down here. So if you look at 
at what he called delta hedging. Hel hedging and replication, these are just two words that mean the same. So let's flip over to 360 and see what he has to say. So delta hedging, this is exactly this derivative that we found. Like, so the derivative of the call price with respect to the stock. So this is what this is what we had written. This is what we had written here. The derivative of the call price with respect to the stock. That's what I call D2. That's the one he has here, and this is what he calls delta. So there will be a section here discussing uh, delta hedging. And uh, there are, of course, more. Uh, there are, of course, many more uh, Greek letters that you compute, and he discusses them in here. Um, he has a theta. Um, so here, the theta uh, of an option, this has to do with the passage of time. So this is a time derivative. So instead of G2, now he's talking about G1. And of course, he could also talk about uh, G22. And that's the one we have over here, and that's the gamma. You take a second derivative with respect to the stock, um, and you call that for, for gamma, and so on. So if you're interested in Greek letters, um, you can see how he's talking about simulation now. This is what we're going to be moving into uh, shortly, how, how to calculate these things using simulation. And then subsequently, we're going to be talking about how to calculate them um, solving this um, this PDE that we had on on the last solving this PDE that we had here uh, using um, a numerical uh, solver like a finite difference method something along those lines. We're going to start by today. We're going to be looking at how to do it using Monte Carlo simulation. Other questions? This is a quick overview of. Of how to hedge in in black shows. Are, are there any questions on this this part? Otherwise, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the same thing, uh, but in the um, in the Heston model. Are there any questions so far? I'm hoping that all of you at this point have seen uh, have seen uh, enough stochastic calculus. Uh, that, that these equations here do, do make sense to you. If not, if not, now is also a good time to ask me what these various terms, what, what they mean if, if there are questions. Sherry has a question, let's see. Could we go over the PD again? Of course we can. Uh, of course, let's have a second look at the PD. I guess it's like shows PD, so, so that's that's probably quite important. Um, just let's have a look at the PD one more time. The, the um, so a second look at the PD. So there, there are two components to it. So the first thing is you need a Martingale property, right? Because Martingales, Martingales have zero DT terms um, in uh, Brownian filtrations. Right. So what 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 I mean is that uh, what I mean is that if if MT MT is a martingale. Well, then if I look at the dynamics of MT, I can write this here as, um, as an integrant, say AT uh, dBT Q. If, if FT is of the form sigma BU Q, um, if MT is a martingale, then it has this form, provided that filtration is given by that. Um, and um, if um, if FT has two Brownian motions in it, like in that Heston model, we're going to be looking at again in a second. So if I had two here, if I had two components, again, I want to have that the 
uh, credit gradation between them is zero. Well then, then DMT would be AT dBTQ plus BT dWTQ. So if there are two Brownian motions in the filtration, martingales are given in terms of two stochastic intervals. Right, so again, keep an eye on the filtration and see how many Brownian motions there are. Um, the more Brownian motions, the more terms you'll have to, to include in the dynamics of a given martingale. Okay, so that's what the martingale representation theorem says. This stuff here, this is, this is the martingale representation theorem. Representation theorem. And if you want to read more about the martingale representation theorem, so this is something that our uh, that Steve has in it over there in that chapter. And let me just show you where to find it. Um, this is here in chapter 5.3, the martingale representation theorem. So you have one brown in motion, and um, then that's the first example we had. And he also has has one with with multiple brown in motions in it somewhere. Um, but it says that all all martingales. Uh, in a filtration, with respect to a filtration that's generated by one boundary motion, will be stochastic integrals with respect to that. Unfortunately, it doesn't say anything about how A looks like. It just says that it exists. Okay, so that's the first part. That's the first thing that you need. And the second thing that you need is the second ingredient that you need is you need you need a mark of uh, you need a mark of structure. You need a Markov process, right? So if ST, so if you had Black-Scholes, if you had Black-Scholes, then you would have your DST would be of the form ST sigma dBT. But if you did Histon, so let's put him in the mix now. If you did Histon, then DST would be ST, or was the square root BT dBTQ. And here you would need uh, dBT would be, what was it? It was kappa theta minus vt dt plus, if we did the simplified one, it would just be a beta, and then it will be a root vt dbtq. So you need a Markov process. Okay, so, so in Black-Scholes, we say, um, is st Markov? Well, if you want that to happen, the right-hand side has to be a function just of the left-hand side. Okay, so it's t times sigma, this is okay. So that's a check mark. If I look at Heston, so he will ask the same question, is st Marco? So now we go down to the Heston model. You look at the right-hand side, is it a function of st? Well, no, because there's also a V here, right? There's another stochastic process. So the answer is uh, no. So, so then, <laughs> so then what do you do? Then you, the next best thing you can do is um, you can ask, uh, okay, so on the right-hand side, I also need a V. Okay, so I could say is, is the pair uh, is T, V, T, Marco? I go up in dimension. So now I look at ST. So now it's the right hand side. So so is is the uh, drift to the DT and DBT terms. So R. Are the DT and DBTQ uh, terms functions? of uh, ST and VT. So if I look at, I look at the volatility, there's no drift in S. So I look at the volatility here, it is ST, VT, so that's okay. This is now a function of ST and VT. I go one down to V, and now here I have drift and volatility. Is the drift and the volatility just functions of ST and V? And the answer is yes and yes. So this is good.
So in the Black-Scholes case, ST is Markov by itself. In the Heston case, ST has to be uh, paired up with V to get the Markov property. But then given that you're looking for a, um, you're looking for a function, then look for, so again, if you're looking at Black-Scholes, so look for, uh, look for a function, uh, what was it, we call it G, T and X, such that, such that um, uh, D, G, uh, has no drift and G at the end is exactly F. If you're in Heston, so if you're in Heston, Heston, then you look for a function. A function. Look for a function g t x, but now we need another one in here. It says call it y, such that. Right, so g g. I should be more specific here. It shouldn't drop. Now we have. Let's be clear here. Like this is d g t s t has no drift, such that. And now we need d g. T, S, T, and V, T has no drift. And G, T, X, and Y at the end is exactly my F. And so how do we get the PDEs out of this? Would we apply Ito's lemma? Right, so if you go back, we look at like Scholes. Like Scholes, this is this one. DG is equal to G1 DT plus G2 DST, one half G22, correct variation of S. And I want this to be zero DT plus. G2, and then whatever we're going to get in here will be ST sigma dBT Q. Right, so we just collect the dt terms. We want to make that a zero. So this is G1 of T and X. That was this guy. And then we're going to get something over there. This is one half G22 T and X. So that's the PDE for Black Scholes. I should have correct variations. So this is X squared, sigma squared should also go there. If I do Heston, it's more messy. I'll do DG. Now I need all these components. So I need a, I need to be able to use each lemma for a two-dimensional process. But on a good day, I think I can get it to work. So let's see. You're going to get G1 DT plus. Then you're going to get these terms. So it's going to be G2 and DST plus one half G22 two two and then correct variation of S. I do exactly the same thing for the V term. There's a V over here, so that's gonna be G3 dV plus one half G33 correct variation of V. And then there's also cross variation because both V and S have a Brownian motion in them. We're gonna get two of them, so times a half, that's a one. I'm going to get G23 cross variation between S and V. So you see the price we're paying going up in dimension, going from uh, S to S and V, it, it goes from having those two terms to having uh, uh, going from having one, two, three terms to having one, two, three, four, five, six terms, right? So we go up in one dimension and it adds three more terms. But we can still find out what the PD is. Like the PD is going to be, um, you have 
you have a zero. Oh, need more space. Let me get a fresh, fresh sheet here. So we're going to get. So here that is G1. So that's a zero. G1. G2 does not have any drift in it. So we forget about him. Then we're going to have a half G22 graduation of S. This was uh, ST squared. Uh, Sigma squared, sigma was square root of vt, so this is a v. <clears throat> Plus g3. Inside v, there's drift, there was a kappa theta minus vt. And then there was one half g33. Correct equation of v, this was this. Uh, Beta squared V. And then we need cross variation G23, and then cross variation between S and V. This is going to be a sigma beta V. All right, and so when all that is said, what you end up with that is left here is my G2, ST uh, G2 ST, the square root of VT, dBTQ. And then there was also something over there. There was a G3. There was a G3 there. And this was, um, uh, what was it? Beta uh, square root of VT, dBTQ. Right, so here you have your PD, you replace, you replace uh, ST by x and vt by y, you're going to get the pd. Zero is equal to g1 plus one half uh, x squared y g22 plus g3 kappa theta minus y plus one half g33 beta squared y plus G23 sigma beta y, and then there's a terminal condition, G, T, X, and Y, this is my F. And if we are in this, in this setting, we, we still wanna have that X is equal to G. So this is how we wanna create the theta. ST VT. So the initial value X0 is going to be G0, S0, V0. And then you match up dynamics to get theta. You look at DXT is equal to DG, which is what we had calculated up here in the previous slide. And we had my GG there, and you can see this all exposed to the same Brownian motion. This would be uh, this would be G two S T plus G three beta square root of V D B T Q. Right now on the left hand side, this was equal to theta S T square root of V T D B T Q. And then you match up, you match up the square root V cancels out on both sides. So you're going to get that theta T is equal to one over S T times G two S T plus G three times beta. So you see there's a correction term compared to compared to black shoals. So in black shoals, the STs will cancel out, you just get G2 here. But because you have volatility of volatility, right? This here is a this is the vol of vol. And I wonder, I wonder if Paul has an opinion about vol of vol. See how far he gets to go in the Greek letters. Uh, I think it's the Vega 373. Uh, 
Yeah, so he does discuss this. You see here he has, he calls it a vega. Um, this vega, this is a strange letter because there is no Greek letter called vega. I don't, I don't know why it's called vega, but everybody calls it that. And you see here, he's taking a derivative with respect to sigma. So this uh, G3 we got ourselves created there, this is this uh, vega that, that he talks about. And I don't know, Alice, oh, sorry, not Alice, uh, Sherry, uh, if, this, if this makes sense. So, so sometimes it can help by looking at an example where it doesn't work. Right, so when does it not work? So, so maybe an example where it does not work. So if it fails, so an example where it fails. So now we can do the, the Heston where we have an extra volatility component. If we have an extra volatility component, this is where we're gonna be in trouble. So we have a beta here. We would have a, a row. And then we have a square root one minus row squared. Like remember this, the reason that we're writing it this way is because overall this object here, this is, this is another Brownian motion uh, for rho between uh, minus one and one. But that's why we're writing it in this funny way, rho b, rho db plus root one minus row squared dw. So here, <clears throat> this is where it fails. And why does it fail? Well, why does it fail? Well, um, if, uh, so say, say, um, say you found your function G and VT, right? This is still gonna be Markovian. There's a square root missing here, square root of VT. So it should go in there. So say that this is, um, this is a martingale. Say that this is a martingale. Um, then we would like to match. So can we get, can we create, can we create uh, theta t uh, as well as the initial value? Well, the initial value will probably, probably do the same thing as here. And so to get theta, you match up. So, so we, when we try to match, when we try to match, when we try to match dg with dx, we have we get a problem. We run into a problem. We fail because on the left hand side, on the left hand side, on the left hand side, we will get uh, g two and then st or the square root vt dptq plus and now <clears throat> what else are we going to get of martingale terms we'll also get something coming from the volatility uh, so this will be g3 and then dv well there'll be volatility over here according to this formula this will be beta root vt and then you have your row. And you have your row dbtq plus root one minus row squared dwtq. And you want that, you want that to be equal to uh, theta. And then it was st root bt dbt. So this is where the problem happens because these two guys are independent. They have nothing to do with each other. So you, to match up, you'll have to match both B and W coefficients, but you only have one unknown. So you need to match, you need to match uh, DBQ term and DW terms, but you only have You only have one free uh, parameter, which is your theta. 
You're going to get two equations and two unknowns. This is not possible. So you see the presence of this second round in motion, it messes up this argument. I can't do that. I cannot create theta. Um, I can't create theta in general because I have two requirements and I only have one free parameter. But you have only one parameter. So in this case, it doesn't work, but that's okay because we know we know in, in this setting in general, um, like you go all the way back to the earlier discussion that we've had. Uh, ready to talk about this. It says here that if, if Q is unique, then, um, then you should be able to do this. But in, in the present case, uh, Q is not going to be unique. Because there's no contradiction here. Um, Indeed, when you have uh, one stock and two round emotions, you're going to get incompleteness. Um, so that that means that there are payoffs which cannot be replicated. So so we're all good. Um, it just it's not possible to uh, to perform a replication in in Heston's model when you have um, two round emotions. Are there any questions or comments on? On this, uh, Sherry, did that help on uh, on the PDE here in the end? Sometimes it, sometimes I've found that it can be helpful to look instead of trying to understand why something works, it can actually be a lot more insightful to give an example where it fails, and um, and so this is what the second part here aims to do. Right? Let's try let's try to look at a, an ugly case in the sense that the theory doesn't really apply and. And it doesn't apply here with two round emotions. So if you want to rectify the problem, the, the way that you fix it is by having two stocks. Instead of just having one stock, you have two stocks. And so you can fix this problem here. So to overcome, to overcome this, uh, say, say there is another, say there is another stock trading. Right, so we'll have um, we'll now have the we'll now have the um, uh, the bank say there's a zero interest rate. We we'll have the stock as before. This was st square root bt uh, d uh, bt uh, q and say so. Let's call this number one here, and let's call say that there's one more. Say that this one here. Say that there is an ST2, and let's just take a Black Scholes one here. So let's take a Black Scholes one here. Let's just take a volatility of one, but let me put the other brown in motion here. Say that this thing is there. But then my wealth, if I can spell it, my wealth dynamics then my wealth dynamics are uh, DXT. So this would be now I'm investing, I'm investing in the, in the bank. I'm investing in the, uh, the first stock. I'm investing in the second stock. Right. And as before this thing here, because the interest rate is equal to zero, this one here is zero. And so now we go back to, to the mess that we had before. And so now we want to match up DG with DX. And you see what changes is that on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, it's going to be the same, but on the right-hand side, we're going to get a different term. We're going to get a different term on the right-hand side. So in, in Heston, Heston becomes, um, to the left-hand side, I'll just copy paste the left hand side here, this will be G2 ST root BT dBTQ. And that other term G3 beta root B rho dBTQ plus root one minus one squared DWTQ 
but that's the left hand side. But now we're going to match this up. We're going to match this up with the dxt, right? And this thing is now going to be what we have here. It's going to be theta one and then s one. Uh, S1 root V dBTQ plus, and now we're going to get the second term that's going to be an S2 dW. And now it works because I match up the terms. If I now match up, I'll get theta 1 S1 of T root vt this is going to be one thing and i'll do i'll do the investment in the second strategy by matching up the w term uh, so the first one will be g2 st1 root vt plus g3 beta root vt rho and then the other one will be, will be G3, beta root V, one minus rho squared. So I'll match up that rounding term with that one and the remaining rounding terms with this one. So here I have two equations. And um, so this is two equations in two unknowns. We're good, we can solve this. And so the, the thing to note here is that the filtration was generated by two Brownian motions. You generated by two Brownian motions and, and we, had, we had two stocks, right? That's equal to the number of Brownian motions. We had two stocks with uh, non-zero uh, balls. Right. That's important too, because otherwise we can't divide, right? So there's a non-zero volatility here and there's a non-zero volatility here. But then, then it works. You can, in this case, then the, uh, so the model, this here implies that is zero, is one, and is two uh, is complete. So that's one way to rectify. If if you want to have, if you want to have a complete model, so you want to be able to calculate what these replicating portfolios are, then you would need uh, as many stocks as you have Brownian motions. Otherwise, uh, you will not be able to solve these uh, these equations like like this one. You can't do it. Are there more questions or comments? More questions or comments? If that's not the case, then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to use simulation. All right, so now we talked about how you can use PDEs. Um, to calculate the um, the replicating portfolio, um, let me spend just half an hour talking a little bit about how one can use simulation to do it. So this the next thing I want to talk about briefly is to so, so to use uh, use simulation. Um, simulation to compute, um, to compute, in this case, it will be theta zero. We already talked about how to use simulation to compute, um, how to compute um, the initial value. So that's the expectation. 
so the the most naive one is we need a derivative right so so the naive the naive way is uh, to re-simulate and this is a bad idea but you could do it right so we need need to compute a derivative right so we call that a derivative so I shouldn't call it f here because that was the payoff. So maybe call it h prime of a, right? Remember that this is defined as, um, like this is a limit as epsilon goes to zero, uh, h, h of a plus epsilon minus h of a divided by uh, epsilon, right? So what you could do, what we need to do, we need, uh, we need a derivative. Uh, we need a derivative with respect to uh, is zero to get our hands on theta zero. And so what we could do is uh, we could have a two-step approach. We could um, we could you could use simulation. You could use simulation to compute. Uh, this expectation of, right, so we're on the queue here, and this expectation of uh, f of st. And you could use, and then you could use simulation again to compute, uh, to compute the same expectation, but But for um, for s zero uh, for s zero being um, being just uh, uh, a little bit changed, a little bit changed with an epsilon. Right, so alter uh, maybe I shouldn't write some zero there, but for s zero replaced by. Right, this value here, this depends upon a zero. Right? This depends on a zero. So, what you should do when you re-simulate is replace replace is zero with uh, is zero plus an epsilon, and then you could take the difference and divide by epsilon. This would give you an expression for this derivative, and that would give you uh, a way to calculate or uh, estimate or approximate this theta zero. In general, this is a bad idea because these simulations, they're, um, they're, there are errors around them. And when you start looking at two errors, uh, two estimates that are not precise, you divide by a very small number here, this becomes, this is unstable. This is not stable. This is, this turns out, I mean, it is, Computing derivatives like this is, in general, is a bad idea. Um, so instead, people have looked at um, people have looked at other ways to do this. Um, a paper uh, that we're going to be discussing. Uh, this is Brody and Glasserman's. Um, this is one of the popular ways, well established ways of doing this. So Brody and Glasserman. Of Columbia, they have proposed a number of ways to, to get around this. And, and the one of the methods is their uh, pathwise derivative. So they suggested a, suggested a pathwise derivative. Yesterday, pass by derivative. And um, what they do is so, say you're in a black Scholes setting. So, a black Scholes world. So, again, the interest rate is zero and sigma t is a constant, different than zero. 
<coughs> right, so in this case, uh, ST uh, has the form uh, S0 times E, or was it sigma BTQ minus one half sigma squared times T. So you can see here as a function of S0, this is smooth, right? So if I look at the derivative with respect to S0 of ST, it's straightforward. This is E to the sigma BTQ minus one half sigma squared T. So if you're looking at something like a call or a put, so let's look at a, let's look at a call. So this was when, uh, this was when our function, this was when our function was uh, x minus a strike. <clears throat> so then the call price, the call price is uh, the expectation. There's no need to discount because we already have, uh, we have a zero interest rate. So you'll have here st minus k positive part. So the derivative, the sensitivity, so to get theta, to get theta zero, we need uh, the derivative with respect to the initial value of this object. And what we propose is to move this derivative inside, okay? So we move this thing inside. So already that is a little bit questionable. Sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. And now we're looking at a hockey stick. So that is also problematic, but the probability that a geometric bounding motion ends up being at the strike is zero. So it's true that this is not differentiable everywhere, but it is almost everywhere. So this here becomes an indicator for when ST is bigger than K And then the derivative is gonna be, uh, I don't need to, the derivative of this thing is what we have here. And then the derivative of ST with respect to S0 is gonna be the one we had up here, uh, E to the sigma BTQ minus one half sigma squared T. And so this can be simulated. This object here can be can be simulated just using um, this expectation. So just as just as uh, you have used uh, Monte Carlo simulation to compute to approximate to approximate um, uh, this EQ of ST minus K positive part, you can use simulation to approximate, to approximate this expectation down here. It is just a different payoff. This is nothing else than ST divided by S0. Right, this object here, this is just another function of ST. <clears throat> so this is a better way, this is a better way of computing this, um, this derivative. My computer is running out of power, literally, so, uh, um, is there a quick question? Otherwise, I think uh, if we need to take a break. Uh, I need to get uh, a power plug up here. Uh, is there a quick question about um, about what we what we've seen on this these last few slides here? Okay, so we will we will have to take a little break so I can get some power on my uh, my laptop again. Um, let's start up uh, around 10 o'clock and switch over to a different Zoom link and then, um, and then we'll continue after a little break. <clears throat>